is a maneuver that will soon help make them the greatest army on Earth. In times of peace, everyday life in a Mongol camp is tranquil, yet preparations for war are always going on. Women care for the sheep and tend to the yurts and carts. Men fix saddles and cure meat, provisions for their long expeditions. The Mongolian men devote even more attention to the preparation of arak, their favorite drink, made from fermented mare's milk. The potion is strong and is often blamed for fighting even wars between the clans. On simple hearths, the Mongols forge scimitar swords, but Special craftsmanship goes into the making of their miracle weapon, the weapon that will make them superior to other armies, the reflex bow. Carefully crafted by layering and gluing wood and horn, the reflex bow can achieve much greater velocity than the traditional European longbow. Together with their scimitars, the Mongol warrior will possess a potent arsenal. The powerful reflex bow is so strong, it requires two men to string it, to bend it against its natural curvature and fit it with a cord made of animal tendon. An arrow shot from the reflex bow can even penetrate a coat of European chain mail. In combination with their hardy horses, it will make the Mongol army virtually invincible. But before Temujin and his men face the armies of the West, they will be forced to contend with the other powerful tribes all around them. In the 12th century, the Mongols are surrounded by enemies, the Merkites, the Naiman, the Tartars. But no matter how bitter the divisions, the tribes share a similar culture shaped by their nomadic way of life. Tribal chiefs, the Khans, enjoy the spoils of their triumphs. They love dancing, music, and the company of women. Wealthy Khans typically keep a dozen or more wives, plus numerous female slaves. Many of the women are brought to the Khan's court by force, bought or abducted from rival clans. Temujin's own mother had been abducted. His father had stolen her from a wedding caravan while she was en route to meet her Merkite husband. Such a crime, though common, draws bitter retaliation, a fact that will one day come to haunt Temujin while he is out with his family on a hunting expedition. Their camp was at the Carolan River's source when one morning, just before dawn, his mother's servant woke the camp with a startling cry. Jimin, what 
Mother, mother, get up. The ground is shaking. I hear it rumble. Azar te firkmit. Ich chime gat morin te urgan sasten. Ayum shikt te chu da esurit. Teru bos. Alone, without his army, Temujin and his family are forced to flee for their lives. But there are not enough horses for everyone. Faced with a difficult choice, Temujin orders his mother to take the horse. wife Borda is left behind, along with the servant woman, to fend for themselves. Whipping the ox, the old woman drove the cart away from the camp, but as she journeyed upstream, soldiers were upon them. The Murkite warriors stop the woman, but she claims to know nothing of Temujin and his family. is taken prisoner by the Murkite warriors. It will take Temujin nine months to rescue her, and in revenge, he launches a brutal assault on the Murkite tribe. They came down on them as if through the smoke hole of their tents, capturing and killing their wives and sons. They struck at their door frames, where their guardian spirit lived, and broke it to pieces. By 1200 AD, Temujin is a war hero. More and more men join him. Fighting at his side earns them rich rewards. Temujin decides it is now time to avenge his father's death. He will attempt to rally his men to their greatest challenge, battle with the powerful Tartars. Since the days of old, Tartars have fought our fathers. Now is the time of our revenge. We will kill every Tartar man taller than the linchpin on the wheel of a cart. We will kill them until they're destroyed as a tribe. Generations of anger are unleashed. The climactic battle between the Mongols and the Tartar will be one of the bloodiest in human history. Temujin makes good on his pledge. 
The surviving Tartar men are beheaded. Only children and potential concubines are spared, taken as slaves. Temujin is not the only one bent on dominating the peoples of the East. <laughs> 